In this video I'll show you how to melt metals in your microwave. Here's a real life example where I made brass scissors that are as useful as a butter knife in a sword fight. Is it possible to make brass scissors by only using a microwave, a vacuum cleaner and a 3D printer? I joined these 3D printed scissors with a graphite pencil core. That way I won't need to drill any holes, because most of time I use plaster of Paris for my metal casting projects. I like it, but it's not great for casting small holes. It can easily break and you can end up with holeless scissors. This video is a short clip from a tutorial I just published on my channel. So if you want to learn how to melt metals in your microwave, check out the video in the description. So what do you need to start melting metals? First thing you'll need is a microwave. It's just an ordinary microwave. The only difference is that most of times I use it flipped on the side. Second thing you'll need is a crucible. But not just any crucible. It needs to be made out of silicon carbide. And the last thing you need is an insulating chamber. It will let the crucible reach temperatures high enough to melt metals like aluminum, brass, copper and even cast iron. Yep, it's that simple. Silicon carbide absorbs microwaves and turns them into heat. Maybe absorbs is not the most scientifically accurate term to use, but you get a point. And that's where the chamber comes in. You need to insulate the crucible so you could trap all that heat and raise the temperature. The chamber is made from ceramic fiber blanket also known as cave wool. When you work with ceramic fiber, make sure to wear a respirator. So here I have ceramic fiber blanket. We'll be doing what I call the rolling method. For that you'll need a cylinder that's a little bit bigger than the crucible that you'll be using. We'll cut a strip of ceramic fiber that's a little bit taller than the crucible. And by the way, make sure your knife is sharp and keep that sharpener close. First thing we'll do is cut one end of the strip in an angle. And now we can start wrapping. As you can probably imagine, the cylinder can be anything that works. A food can, a jar, and so on. When desired thickness is achieved, we'll cut the other end in an angle. Ceramic fiber comes in different thicknesses. The one I use is a 25 mm sheet. So the first chamber was three layers thick and this one only two layers, so it's around 50 millimeters before wrapping. We'll be using a captain tape to wrap the chamber and as you can see it comes in different sizes. Make sure that the captain tape's long term temperature resistance is at least 250 degrees Celsius or higher. So next step is wrapping the chamber with a captain tape. We'll take a few sheets of ceramic fiber and we'll put the chamber on top. Make sure that the smoothest side of the chamber is facing up. And then we just remove the extra material. I find this cutting somewhat satisfying. I'm gonna flip it around and remove one of the sheets because I can't count. Two is more than enough for this small chamber. And then we just join everything together with more captain tape. Next we'll cut out a circle using a cylinder as a guide and we'll put it inside of the chamber, assuming you have space.
If you have a blowtorch, I recommend heating up the inside of the chamber. If you don't own a blowtorch, don't worry about it, it's fine. So the next step is pretty much the same that we did before, but this time we're making the base. I like to stick the edge of the captain table to the chamber, it helps to hold it in place while we do the wrapping. Next step is adding some feet. To keep the thing simple, we just gotta make these ceramic fiber and captain tape pillows. Sometimes I use four, other times three. Next step is making the bottom of the chamber and top of the base nice and smooth. For that we'll be using a sanding glass that I'll show you how to make in a second. I like to hot glue the glass to the table, it works very well and when you're done it can be easily removed with some alcohol. So we'll start with a piece of glass. In this example I'll cut a glass circle, obviously you don't have to do that, just use the glass as it is. If hot gluing is not an option, you can also use a cling film to stop the glass from moving, just make sure the glass is clean. If you want you can use a sandpaper to wet sand the glass, or alternatively you can use another piece of glass or a drinking glass with a flat bottom to sand the main glass with some silicon carbide and water. You will need silicon carbide to make the crucible anyway, so we're using the same material that you'll need later but just for different purpose. In this example I'm actually using coarser grit silicon carbide because I have it but the fine grit will also work. Now we can use the sanding glass to smoothen the bottom of the chamber by mashing the layers together. Wet the glass and the chamber with some water and start mashing. It only took me a minute to make it nice and smooth. It's normal for the hole to start closing at the top or the bottom, depends how you look at it. More you sand, more it will close. All you do is cut it open with a sharp knife and then just use your fingers to shape it to your liking. And then we do the same thing with the base. The only difference when you need to check on progress, make sure you slide the base off the glass. Do not lift it because it's like a suction cup. The pulling action can separate the layers and make the base less firm. Next step is what I call microwave drying. We'll microwave the chamber until the most water evaporates. If there's a lot of water present, you can take out the chamber and wipe microwave walls. There's no more condensation on walls and the chamber feels dry, so now we do the same thing with the base. If the base grows a toad skin, don't worry about it. You can dry sand it on glass. At this stage don't worry about the base looking perfect. When you wrap it with a captain tape it's normal for it to curve up. So after wet sanding and microwaving it might not look as good as you want to. Don't worry about it, it will fix itself later. That is, you will. Next we'll blowtorch the surfaces to make them a little bit harder. And again, if you don't have a blowtorch, just skip this step. If you happen to burn the edges of the captain tape, make sure to cut off that burned part. By burning the captain tape to a charcoal level, you can create an arcing point. Arcing is when you put a sharp metallic object in the microwave and then you see a lightning show. Because of arcing, the captain tape will heat up in that one point and it will keep heating up and smoldering. So it can lead to something like this. At this point you could use the chamber already, but you risk in crucible sticking if it's heated up too much. Not only it's a hazard when your crucible is full with molten metal, it's also annoying. So what options do we have? 
One of the options is kiln wash. You mix it with water and brush it onto the base. You can also brush it onto the chamber. You'll see me doing it in another example. And then you just microwave dry it. And the last step would be heating up the crucible if you have made one already. The first time you use the chamber, it will get quite hot. There's still some water trapped inside from sanding and kiln wash. The chamber is hot, but I can easily take it out without gloves. And by the time I set up the camera, it was already too hot to handle without gloves. Unless you hold it by the top. Kiln wash worked, but I'll definitely need to add another layer. And if you can't find kiln wash, here's one way to make your own. For this recipe, you'll need kaolin clay, aluminum oxide and optional some pigment. I mixed 50% of kaolin with 50% of aluminum oxide and I added a little bit of pigment. Shake, 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 shake your kiln wash. Because of the pigment, we ended up with a light gray kiln wash, not white, so it's easier to see when you brush it on. After microwave drying it, the gray has pretty much disappeared. And as I mentioned before, I also like to apply some kiln wash onto the bottom of the chamber, but I usually dilute it with water. Okay, let's try it out. It's normal for the kiln wash to crack. From all that heat, ceramic fiber will sink in. Here's a base that's been used quite a lot and it's been covered with a kiln wash a couple of times. That's why I said not to worry about making perfectly flat base, because it will not stay that way. You have better chances of making the base flat if you resend it after it has been used a few times. This time it came out much flatter. And again, don't worry about perfection. I also like to sand the chamber and I don't bother reapplying kiln wash. There's enough kiln wash soaked into the fibers. A reminder how it looked before sanding and here's after. Let me show you one more way to make the crucible nonstick and it's by using only aluminum oxide or aluminium if you prefer. Aluminum oxide on its own is great to stop your crucible from sticking but it's not very brushable. That's why it's better to mix it with kaolin clay. And by the way, kaolin clay on its own is also an option, but it won't have those nonstick properties. It will work to some degree. If we only use aluminum oxide under the crucible and we don't cover the bottom of the chamber and top of the base with kiln wash, these surfaces can start to deteriorate. They are kind of hard, but they could be harder. Now it's not always an issue, sometimes it can stay hard or it can harden once you start melting metals. And it can also depend on ceramic fiber sheet. I had batches of ceramic fiber that were not great, they were way too soft. So next step is optional, you can use it if you need it. Here's a way how to harden ceramic fiber by using boric acid solution. So what's the boric acid solution? Well, it's boric acid mixed with some water. That's all it is. Let me show you how I do it. We're gonna grab a scale and we're gonna weight some water. Next we'll add 5% of boric acid. So in this case, 5% from 400, that's 20. We're gonna heat it up until boric acid dissolves. Next, we'll pour the boric acid solution into this spray bottle. But first, we need to make sure that the liquid is not too hot. I suggest using between 5 and 10% of boric acid. If you use more than 10%, boric acid will start to recrystallize rapidly once the water starts cooling down and your spray bottle can clog up. You're gonna wet the bottom of the chamber with a boric acid solution and then just microwave dry it. 
Depending how concentrated is your solution, you might need to do it a few times. I suggest not overdoing it, because that can create other issues. Next we need to burn that boric acid to harden the surface. You can see the flame turning green from the boric acid. I'm gonna make aluminum oxide slurry by mixing it with water. And then I applied it in the spot where the crucible will go. After microwave drying it, it's hard enough to not fall off, but it's not exactly glued to the base. Let's see how well it works. Before I show you how to make your own crucible, let's watch another short style video and a word on how you can support this channel. I've been using this Ender Free S1 Pro 3D printer for last few months for all of my metal casting projects. Geekbuying sent me this printer and gave me a coupon code that you can use to get this printer cheaper. Before we continue, let me show you a real life metal casting example. I'm gonna cast this egg cup in copper. I'm gonna melt this pipe in a microwave so I can make a copper egg cup. I 3D printed an egg cup that I designed. I also designed these what I like to call anchor points. With the anchor points I can easily attach the filament to the model. They're basically just sprues to help the metal flow. This video is a part of tutorial that I just published on my channel. So if you want to know how to melt metals in an ordinary microwave, check out the video. Let me show you two ways to make a crucible. The first one I call the glass method. You'll need some fine grit or almost powder-like silicon carbide. We'll be using a drinking glass as a mold. Fill it up with silicon carbide to know how much you'll need. We'll add between 8 and 10% of sodium silicate. Sodium silicate is also known as water glass. Here's a piece of cured sodium silicate mixed with some food coloring. Maybe that's why it's called water glass. I use 37% water glass. Anything between 37 and 40% should give you similar results. The reason I mention it because there are products out there that claim to be water glass, but in reality it's a very diluted product. So we have added the water glass, now we just mix it properly. We'll put it into the glass bit by bit, pressing down with a tool of your choice. To be clear, this is not the tool of my choice, but it will do for this demonstration. I prefer to 3D print a press that fits the glass, so you can make the crucible nice and tight. Then we just carve out the center. I like to use my fingers to shape the crucible. Unless the glass is very tall, then I call E.T. I'm here to help. We'll microwave to full power until the glass shatters. Once cold, carefully remove the remaining glass. You can clean it up with different kinds of sanding tools. I call it the stage 1. You could use the crucible at this stage, but maybe you shouldn't. If the crucible hasn't come out strong enough, it could split in half during the use. That said, more often than not, I will use smaller crucibles at this stage, but maybe not with as much metal in them. To be honest, I don't remember when was the last time I had a crucible fail at the stage 1. But then again, I have 
practiced a lot and I know what to look for. So it's up to you if you want to use the crucible at this stage. Just remember the risks and whatever you do, it's on you. One more thing, if you do decide to use crucible at stage 1, make sure to heat it up in the chamber before you use it to melt metals. We will wrap the crucible in ceramic fiber sheet. And I'm only using a half sheet or so. We'll use two rubber bands to hold that ceramic fiber sheet tightly wrapped. We'll microwave it until the crucible turns glowing red. The rubber bands will break and shoot away from the crucible. Now let it cool. Be careful, the crucible can be still hot, even if the ceramic fiber feels cool to the touch. We will scrape off ceramic fiber, and be careful, this action produces a lot of ceramic fiber dust, so wear a respirator. Now we have a crucible that's much stronger. Let's try it out by melting two 8mm aluminum cable crimps. They weigh 24 grams. And here's how the crucible looks like after one time of use. The same. The second way to make the crucible I call the freezing method. You can download two different size molds from my Patreon page. And don't worry, they're free, you don't have to be a Patreon, unless you want to. Let me clarify, these molds you can 3D print with everything you need to make a crucible. So first thing we do is screw on that little lid. And then we just put together the rest of the mold. Just like before, we'll mix silicon carbide with water glass. For this small mold we'll need 100 grams of silicon carbide, give or take. And then between 8 and 10% of water glass. Then we fill the mold step by step and use the tools provided, pressing down the silicon carbide as tight and as good as you can. If you're making the crucible on a hot summer day, be aware that the water glass can start hardening pretty quickly. So it's better to do it when it's not that hot. Putting the water glass in the fridge before you use it can help. We'll put it in a freezer for a few hours. Time to open it up. We'll be using an Allen key to unlock the inside mold. Keep twisting and pulling. If you don't have an oven, you can leave it on a table to harden naturally for a few hours. And then you'll heat it up in a microwave to finish hardening. It doesn't have to be super hot. So in this case it's approximately 200 degrees Celsius. If you do have an oven, I suggest to use it. Preheat it, put the frozen crucible inside and turn off the oven. Another method is to microwave the frozen crucible on low power step by step. I usually cover the crucible with a plastic cup that has holes drilled in it. And then I remove the cup after a few cycles. I keep microwaving the crucible little by little, for example 10 seconds on, 30 seconds off. This method works, but remember low power and step by step, or you risk in messing up the crucible.
Our crucibles have reached stage 1. To take them to stage 2, it's all the same. Microwave wrapped in ceramic fiber. Let me demonstrate what happens when crucible doesn't reach those glowing red temperatures. As you can see, the ceramic fiber hasn't really stuck to the crucible. It has only stuck a little bit. Not a lot of hardening has happened if you can remove the ceramic fiber that easily. And here's the opposite. This crucible was microwave for a little bit too long. But that said, it's fine. It's still gonna do the job. Look how shiny it is. So which method is better, the glass or the frozen mold? I think you should start with a glass method crucible, because it's easier for a beginner and your crucibles will come out much stronger, even at stage 1. Unless you did it way too thin or you didn't do a good job in pressing the silicon carbide into the glass mold. Don't get me wrong, the freezing method crucibles are also great, but it takes more practice to make them sort of fail-proof. Listen, there are so many things I could tell you about microwave metal melting. So many steps were replaced with alternative ways to do things, so this project would be easier, faster and safer to replicate. And I think we succeeded. I can make everything, the chamber, the base and the crucible in under an hour. I know, I know, I practiced a lot, so I might not be the best example. This is where I'm going with this. If you find a value in this video, do me a favor. Press the like button because it really helps the channel. And if you haven't subscribed, consider subscribing and ringing the bell. I'll be publishing a lot of metal casting examples in YouTube Shorts format. The reason our chamber is so effective is because of materials we use. I have seen people making microwave kilns and doing microwave metal melting with materials that are not that great. So they end up with chambers or kilns that are not very efficient. Let me show you what I mean. I pre-melted 24 grams of aluminum or two of those 8 mm rope crimps. To melt this much aluminum takes around 4.5 minutes in a crucible that's cold. Let's repeat the experiment with the same crucible and same chamber, but this time I'll put a fire brick inside of the microwave. And I'll microwave it for even longer, let's give it 6 minutes. Because I was not watching the microwave, I didn't hear the timer going off, so I ended up microwaving for 6 minutes and 20 seconds. So that's around 40% longer than before. Despite the fact that we microwaved it longer, it was not enough to melt the metal. So what happened? The fire brick absorbed a good portion of the microwaves and it heated up. In some parts it has reached almost 100 degrees Celsius. That's why it's important to select materials that are microwave friendly. Materials that don't heat up too much in a microwave or heat up a little bit. So you saw me melting some metal in 4 minutes and 30 seconds. Not bad, but it's also not the best we can do. Melting times can depend on the power of your microwave, size of your crucible, chamber and even the shape of the metal. Going back to the power, it's not just the power on the paper. The magnetron can also become weaker with the time. It can wear out. That's why if you buy an old second-hand microwave, you don't really know what you're getting. It happened to me a few years ago with this old microwave that I bought only because it looked big in the picture. You can guess how that turned out. It did work and I kept using it until I tried another microwave and realized that it can melt metals much faster, despite it being less powerful 
on the paper. To give you a rough idea, melting half crucible of aluminum would probably take between 5 and 8 minutes. Same amount of brass, probably between 8 and 14 minutes. Obviously there's too many variables. The biggest aluminum piece I have done to date is probably this one. It weighs around 80 grams. Now it's not massive by any means, but it's also not tiny. And in case you're wondering what it is, I will publish an article about it on my Patreon page if there's enough interest. The biggest brass piece I have ever cast is probably this one. It's a failed cast. Well, it could probably be saved, but I haven't done it. And it was supposed to be a scotch tape dispenser. And it's pretty heavy. It weighs just under 900 grams. It took me between 25 and 30 minutes to melt that much brass. One of the reasons why it took so long was because I had to top up the crucible. Microwave metal melting, at least in this setup, is not the best for topping up crucibles. Yes, you can melt cast iron and even stainless steel, but don't expect to do it in large quantities. You can check out my YouTube short where I made a cast iron Mario. Melting metals with a melting point that high will significantly reduce the lifespan of your crucible, chamber and the base. It's also possible for the crucible to soften because of these extreme temperatures. It has only happened to me once or twice when melting stainless steel. The crucible took an oval shape because I was holding it with tongues. And then it cooled down in like 3 seconds, taking its new shape. If you struggle to melt those higher melting point metals, you can always insulate your crucible. Let's talk about safety. Is it okay to flip the microwave on the side? I have never had any problems and I have used a lot of microwaves. There's nothing in a microwave that will stop working only because it's flipped on the side. And I only base it on my own experience. Each microwave is different, so if you're not sure, don't do it. But you might not need to flip it on the side. This small chamber fits fine in this 30 liter microwave. One of the reasons why I do flip it on the side is because of these microwave kilns that I use to burn out plaster molds. And what about microwave energy escaping because you turned your microwave on the side? Well, that should not happen. But if you're worried, you can always get one of these microwave leakage detectors. Why do I make my chambers so thin? If you do a quick meltdown, you will not benefit from having a thicker chamber. In fact, it could be the opposite. Yes, I said ceramic fiber is microwave friendly, but only to the point. It also heats up a little bit. So if you make your chamber massive, you're also adding extra material that will eat all those microwaves and leave less for the crucible. In other words, using too much ceramic fiber can block some of the microwaves reaching the crucible. Now in real life situation you probably won't notice much of a difference between using thinner or thicker chambers for quick meltdowns. But it could be noticeable if you make your chambers extremely thick thinking that it's gonna make your metal melting process faster in small crucibles. That said you will need to make your chambers thicker when melting higher melting point metals or using bigger or thicker crucibles. It all depends what you melt, the quantity and the size of the crucible. What you will see me doing quite often is preheating the crucible with a blowtorch. I only do it for 30 seconds or a minute, but it's enough to shave a few minutes of microwaving in some cases. And how it's even possible that we can put metal in the microwave? What about arcing? Arcing is actually not that common. There is a reason why I folded the fork and put another sharp object beside it. To increase the chances of arcing happening. It doesn't mean that you should put metal in a microwave when cooking food. What I'm saying is that arcing is not an issue. Especially when a metal is inside the crucible that absorbs large portion of the microwaves. One of the reasons why I don't wear gloves on some occasions is to demonstrate how efficient is the chamber. 
When you do these quick meltdowns, the chamber doesn't have time to heat up from the outside. Unless you microwave for longer or the crucible stays in the chamber for longer, then sure, it will get hot and you'll need gloves. That said, please wear your gloves at all times. This is only for demonstration purposes. I know there's space of improvement in my personal safety equipment. I'm not the perfect example. Stay safe and happy metal melting.